Parsha Slech Lecha is the third installment in the book of Genesis, the third Parsha in the Torah. In it, we find 126 verses spread out over five and a half chapters. And we read about the second mitzvah in the Torah out of 613. And in fact, in the whole book of Genesis, as we mentioned earlier, there's only three mitzvahs. The rest of the mitzvahs come in the later books. The subject of this week's Parsha is Abraham. And even though we met him at the end of last week's Parsha, briefly, we learned about his father and his two brothers and the fact that they traveled from their place of birth, from ur Kastim to the city of Haran. We don't really get into Abraham's story very much. We really are going to be following him for this week's Parsha and the next week's Parsha. And of course, his children, his son, his grandson, his great-grandchildren are going to be the subject of the rest of the book of Genesis. Now, Abraham is 75 years old, and even though, according to the Midrash, he's had a very robust backstory, he, at a very young age, discovered God thanks to his own mental faculties. He was someone who was an innovator and an iconoclast, someone who was promoting the idea of one God in a sea of paganism. And even though they got him to all kinds of trouble, uh, according to the Midrash, he was thrown into a fiery furnace. There was assassination attempts. He may have been imprisoned, but we don't really read about that in the Torah. That is in the Midrash. The Torah picks up his story, and he's 75 years old. And chapter 12 begins, Hashem said to Abraham, go for yourself from your land, from your relatives, from your father's house, to the land that I will show you. God says, it's time for you to leave this place and move to a different land Abandon your homeland, abandon your relatives, abandon your father's house, and travel to the land that I will show you. Now, this is going to be a theme throughout the whole Parsha, that there's going to be many instances where God is going to prophesy to Abraham. He's going to make several promises to him, pledges to him. He'll have a a great nation, he'll be father of, of a great nation, he'll be father of many nations. But especially with relation to the ownership of the land of Israel, in four separate instances in this week's Parsha, we're going to be reading about God promising that Abraham and Abraham's descendants will be the owners of the land that we call today the land of Israel. Now, the Mishnah tells us that Abraham was tested with 10 distinct tests, and he was successful. He triumphed and succeeded in each one of these tests. And this is one of those examples. God tells Abraham, I want you to leave your homeland, leave your father's house, leave the place where you grew up, abandon your identity that you had previously, and go to the unknown, go to the land that I will show you. Rashi indeed points out that God didn't actually tell him where he's going. He says, okay, take your family, take your household, take everything that you own, and travel into the unknown. I'm not going to tell you where the destination is. You have to trust God. And that, of course, is a great test because, you know, to, to leave the place where you live and not even know where you're going, get in the car, we're going, we're moving, but not even know where the destination is, that, of course, demands tremendous faith. Now, it's an important, especially that we're about to get into the character and the persona of Abraham, uh, this idea of test, that he was tested with 10 tests and he succeeded in all of them. It's interesting when the Mishnah tells us this idea that Abraham was given 10 tests, it labels him, it calls him Abraham of Vinu, our father. And it's somewhat unique because the previous Mishnah, this is in the book of the chapters of the Fathers, the Avos, the previous Mishnah also talks about Abraham, but it just names him Abraham. It doesn't call him Abraham our father. Whereas when it talks about Abraham and his tests, it mentions that he's our father. And the idea is that with respect to Abraham's test, he is our father, i.e., we are genetically linked to Abraham with respect to his triumphs in his tests. And the idea was that it's a common idea in Jewish philosophy that whatever Abraham was successful in doing and overcoming the resistance, those qualities became inherent and innate in his descendants. So this idea that the Jewish people are always wandering, that we don't really have stability, that we're trusting God and going to the places unknown, 
that stems from Abraham's initial test. He kind of implanted it in the spiritual DNA of his descendants that we are now his sons. He's Abraham, our father, with respect to these ideas. Of course, in next week's parasha, we'll read about the uh, binding of Isaac and the various uh, sacrifices and influences of martyrdom that are on display there. And of course, those concepts, those themes are ever present in Jewish in Jewish life and Jewish history. Uh, now, Rashi also points out that there was two reasons why God did not tell him where he was going. Number one, it was so that he would cherish the destination. It's like when you have, you want to reveal something and you want the recipient to appreciate it, you don't necessarily tell them everything right away. You kind of reveal it bit by bit. Similarly, God wants Abraham to love and cherish the land of Israel the land of Canaan, and therefore he doesn't reveal to him the destination. He makes it exciting for him, number one. Number two, Rashi says that the second reason why God did not reveal the destination is because he wanted to give Abraham reward for each word, meaning go to the land that I will show you. But moreover, he didn't reveal to him till the destination was present, meaning that Abraham says, is told, okay, go head out in this direction. But he wasn't told where the destination is, and every time he reached a fork in the road, God said, okay, here you make a left, here you make a right, go this way, go that way. Abraham's like a blindfolded man getting instructions from a person accompanying him, and every step he's being guided by God, he's getting a reward for each step. And God says, you know what, it's not going to be terrible for you. In this new place where I'm going to send you, I'm going to make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you shall be a a blessing. Rashi says, what does it mean? You should be a blessing. From now on, you you are going to have the ability to bless other people. Moreover, God tells him, I will bless those who bless you and those who curse you, I will curse and all the families of the earth shall be bless, shall bless themselves by you. You're going to become a fountain of blessing. People that are good to you, people that are good to your children, people that are good to the Jewish people, they themselves will flourish and those who are bad to us will be cursed. So Abraham gets the instruction. He's 75 years old. He takes his wife, his brother-in-law and nephew Lot with him. His wife, his name is Sarai at the time. And they take all their wealth with them and all the souls that they made in Haran. And they leave for the land of, the, of Canaan and they arrive in the land of Canaan. So this is an interesting thing. They took with them the souls that they made in the, in the city of Haran. Says Rashi, what does this mean, the souls that they made in Haran? These are the souls of the people whom they influenced to adopt the ways of monotheism. Abraham would reach out to the men of the town, teach them about God, prove the logic and the rationale behind one creator. Sarah would reach out to the women and they developed a following. They developed a movement. And these people were so committed to Abraham, Abraham is moving and they're going along with him. And this is part of Abraham's great qualities, that he did not subsist with just learning about the truth himself, he would influence the people around him. He would tell them, listen, this idolatry, this paganism that you're obsessed with, it's a bunch of nonsense. These animal, the, these idols don't really have any true power. You yourself made them. Why are you offering sacrifices and libations to them? You have to take these idols and shatter them and destroy them and adopt a worldview where there's only one power. All the powers coalesced behind one deity. It's the Almighty. He's invisible and only him is worthy of our worship. That that was Abraham's message and it resonated and he developed a following. And here the Torah says those people are called the souls that they made in Haran. Says the Talmud, if I teach someone else Torah, it's as if I made them. Anyone, whoever teaches his fellow's son Torah, it's considered as if, in the, in the eyes of the Torah, in the eyes of Scripture, it's considered as if they made them. These are the souls that Abraham and Sarah made because they taught them the proper way in life. And they headed toward the direction of Canaan. So it's interesting, if you read the, the, the text in Hebrew, it's, it seems kind of strange uh, they take Sarai, Abram takes Sarai and Lot, 
and the wealth and the souls that they made, and they left to go for the land of Canaan, and they came to the land of Canaan. It's kind of an interesting use of term. They left in the direction of Canaan, and they arrived in Canaan. And I think this dovetails with what we mentioned earlier. Abraham didn't know where they were going. They headed towards Canaan, but in until they arrived, he didn't realize that that was a destination. I think there's an important lesson here. Sometimes we don't know where the destination of our life, of our efforts, where that is. But we have to t- kind of take cues from God and let, let the circumstances that he placed us in, let that guide us what the next step is. And then we'll take from the next step, we'll go to the next step and let God worry about the, nas- about the destination, let him worry about the big picture. So they arrived into Canaan and they Abraham is traveling in the northern parts of Canaan in the city of Shechem in the plains of Moreh. And the Torah tells us that the Canaanites were then in the land. And it's interesting. It doesn't say that the Canaanites were in the land. It says the Canaanites were then in the land, implying that they weren't there pre- previous and maybe they won't be there afterwards. So Rashi tells us that when the world was kind of divided up amongst the three sons of Noah, his son Yephes, Japheth, got Europe. His son Shame got Asia. And his son Ham got Africa. And of course, the land of Israel, if you know the geography, almost straddles these three worlds. It's kind of at the, at the isthmus connecting Africa, Asia, and Europe. And we know throughout uh, the history, this land has been such a critical juncture connecting these various worlds that it became like a point of contention. The people who lived in Europe sometimes controlled it. Africans sometimes controlled it. Asians in the Middle East and even the Far East, they sometimes had a say in the land. And this is interesting. Rashi tells us that really this was this land was apportioned to shame, but the Canaanites were then in the land, meaning that they were conquering the land. The, the children of Ham, the Canaanites, were conquering the land of Israel from the descendants of shame, implying that really it does belong to the descendants of shame, and that would, of course, be Abraham, but at that time was controlled by the Canaanites. So this is interesting, this idea that the land of Israel is contentious. It's a land that is heavily disputed. Everyone seems to want it. It's not a modern phenomenon. It's something that existed all the way back in biblical times. Okay, so now Abraham's in Israel and God appears to him again. Hashem appears to Abraham and says to him, to your offspring, I will give this land. So Abraham built an altar to Hashem, and then he relocated to the mountain east of Beth El, and he built a second altar, and he invoked the name of God. Then Abraham journeyed on, journeying steadily towards the south. So Abraham is given this amazing promise. He gets the land of Israel, God appears to him and tells him, your children will be the owners of this land. I created the land, says God, I'm going to give it to you. And Abraham, of course, is very excited with that. So he built an altar. On the altar, that was uh, a place where he prayed. That's what Rashi says. Comes along the Ramban and says, no, this altar was not a venue for prayer. Rather, it was almost a platform where Abraham would give speeches and would convene people to hear his message of monotheism. And what Abraham, and the reason why in successive verses, verse 7 and verse 8, Abraham's building altars. That was his thing. He was a traveling peddler of truth, of of monotheism. And he was in one place. He built an altar, gather a crowd, and teach them about God. And then he'd go to a different place and gather a crowd and teach them about God. And the Ramban points out that the land of Israel is, and certainly was at the time, especially auspicious to get people to believe. Abraham already believed in ur and in Haran, but his success in influencing the masses really took off once he comes to the land of Israel, a land where he's unlocking all these blessings that God tells him about, but also a land that's most primed for believing in God. And there's an interesting uh, little tidbit here, Rashi points out, that 
as Abraham is traveling, he's pitching his tent. But in Hebrew, the, the actual word referring to the tent is written in the feminine, meaning that he pitched his wife's tent before he pitched his own tent. And this is again a pattern that we're going to see again and again throughout the Torah's narrative about Abraham, that every little nuance of his behavior contains within it lessons in proper character. And here we see that he's traveling from place to place, and every place he goes, he's to pitch his tent. But whose tent does he pitch first? He pitches his wife's tent. The Torah is telling us that it's important for us to model ourselves after Abraham. If there's kindness that needs to be done, your wife goes first, and then it's your turn. Now, Abraham seems to be settling down nicely in the land of Israel. He's traveling all around. He goes, he starts heading south towards Jerusalem. But as he's kind of getting his bearings in the land of Israel, there's a famine. And Abraham descended to Egypt to sojourn there because the famine was very severe in the land. And thankfully, in modern times, famines are much more rare. But certainly in antiquity, where we they didn't have such an advanced uh, agricultural technology like we have today, Famines were quite common. If there's a bad winter, if there's a bad season, there's a bad harvest, there's a a swarm of locusts, what are you going to do? You might – people would quite commonly starve to death. So there's a famine right after Abraham gets the land of Israel. There's a famine and he has to flee. And that in itself is another test. God tells Abraham, go to the land of Israel. I'm going to make you rich. You're going to be blessed. Things are going to be great. And he gets to Israel and things aren't that great. And he has to leave. There's a famine. He's scared he's going to die and starve to death. And that, of course, is a test for Abram to see. Is he going to question God? He's going to say, wait a minute. God's not keeping his word. God told me things are going to be great here. And I get here and he gives me a famine. That's the test. Abraham is successful in not questioning God and not losing his faith over the famine. And he travels to Egypt. And on the way to Egypt, he realizes he has a problem. His wife, Sarai, is beautiful. And he's going to get to the Egyptians, and they're not so used to seeing such a beautiful woman, and they might abduct her, and they might kill him. So what does he do? He comes up with a solution. He says, tell them that you're my sister. So things will be good for me. I'll survive. I'll, I'll live, and I won't be killed as a result of them trying to usurp you from me. Now, it's really interesting if you kind of un- unpack this episode. First of all, what do we see about the Egyptians? In the Egyptian worldview of the time, murder wasn't so bad. But adultery? Well, that was a big no-no. It's almost like the exact opposite of the morality standards of the time that we live in. In our world, adultery is is common. It's not even illegal. Whereas murder, of course, that's terrible. And here we see the Egyptians, it was the other way around. Murder was okay. If Listen, if Abraham's married to Sarai and we really want Sarai, we're not going to take Sarai if she's a married woman. Oh, no, we can never do that. She's a married woman. That's sacrosanct. She's untouchable. It's totally taboo to go take a married woman. But a murder, hey, things like that happen. And we actually know uh, historically that during that time, people, you know, the most common cause of death was probably murder. Uh, a third of, up to a third of people, that's how they died. And today, of course, uh, murder is still prevalent or still exists in our society. Of course, that's terrible. But the odds of someone dying out of murder is vanishingly small in, in our country, most countries. And here we see that the perspective, the worldview was that murder, listen, it happens. It's it's okay if it's going to enable you to take the woman that you want. She won't be married after her husband is dead and that therefore she'll be okay. And it's interesting. The Torah, the Torah's perspective is that morality comes from God. And therefore, it's not up to us to make up standards because as we see, if we make up standards, then the standards that exist for us today – We may think they're moral, but a future society may think that they're barbaric. Just like we look back at previous societies and their moral mores and we say that they are, or they, they are in our eyes, barbaric. So what's the solution? Abraham is not married to Sarai. Abraham is just a big brother. He's his, he's her brother and she's his sister. 
and therefore they're not going to attack him. So the Ramban points out, wait a minute, isn't Abraham, isn't he allowing Sarai to be taken? Isn't the right thing for him to defend her? It's interesting. So the Ramban says that Abraham made a mistake. He shouldn't have done what he did. He shouldn't have have left Sarai to the dodge, so to speak, by saying that she's fair game. She is his sister. He should have said, no, she's my wife, and trust that God will watch over them. That's what the Ramban says. And one of the other commentaries points out is that Abraham did not make a mistake. What was he supposed to do? If he stays in the land of Israel, he's going to die of hunger. So he has to go to the place where there's where there's food, and that was Egypt. So he has to go to Egypt. Okay. So what he's if, if he's going to say that she is his wife, well, they're going to kill him and take her regardless. So what does Sarai have? She's still going to be accosted, and her husband is also dead. Whereas if he says that she is his sister, then her husband will still be alive. Maybe they're about to flee this terrible place. But, of course, she will be taken, but she'll be taken regardless. So it's just an interesting thing that th- there's two ways to look at what Abraham did. Did he make a mistake or not? I think regardless, there's a very powerful lesson. And that is that Abraham is telling us almost that his wife is like his sister. And this is an idea we mentioned a few weeks ago, that maybe maybe the lesson is that a healthy marriage is when the husband and wife are so committed to each other, they become like siblings. Just like you can't change your sibling, your sister is your sister regardless. Maybe what Abraham is telling us is, is that a healthy marriage is one where there aren't so many emergency exits to make it possible for us to flee the marriage. No, we're all in. She's like our sister and then and we'll make it work out. Maybe such an attitude is one that's more likely to succeed. Anyhow, they go ahead with this plan. They see Sarai. She's so beautiful. They start lauding her to Pharaoh, and she's taken. And Abraham, her, I guess, brother, they think, uh, they they shower him with all kinds of presents, sheep, cattle, donkeys, slaves and maidservants, female donkeys, camels, and Sarai is now in the house of Pharaoh. But Hashem protects her, the Almighty protects her. And he afflicts Pharaoh, along with his household, with severe plagues because of the matter of Sarai, the wife of Abraham. So everyone in the house of Pharaoh is stricken with illness. Pharaoh is not able to do his plans with Sarai. So what does Pharaoh figure out here? Pharaoh summons Abraham and says to, her, says to him, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she is your wife? Why did you say she's my sister? So that I would take her as my wife. Now, here is your wife. Take her and go. It's an interesting thing. And the Ramban points this out. Pharaoh, without being told that there was a deception here, that Sarai was really Abram's wife, Pharaoh figured this out on his own. All kinds of terrible plagues befall him and his household. And he asks himself, am I making a mistake here? Maybe the reason why these bad things are happening to us is because God is disappointed in my behavior. She's really his wife. And therefore, he calls over Abram and says, why do you do this to me? You know, this is an interesting thing. We think of certainly someone like Pharaoh uh, of yesteryear as being someone who's very uncouth, very unsophisticated, certainly someone who's distant from spiritual principles from spiritual ideas. And here we see that he asked himself this question, why did this bad thing happen to me? And he concluded that he must have made a mistake. He was spiritually attuned. My grandfather used to say that the Talmud tells us in the book of Baruchos, page 5a, that if someone notices that bad things are befalling him or her, they should examine their deeds, see what message God is trying to send them. And here we see Pharaoh, something bad happened to him. And right away, he undergoes an introspection to say, what did I do wrong? Pharaoh had some spiritual sensitivity. He gives Sarai back to Abraham and he makes sure no one touches them and he sends them along their way. 
and they return north back to Israel. The famine has subsided. They've survived the experience of Egypt. They still have Lot with him. But now Abraham is laden with all kinds of livestock and silver and gold. His wealth is burgeoning. The verse points out that on his way back to Egypt, he patronized the same businesses that he had used on the way down. And Rashi tells us that this is a lesson for us in proper conduct. If you are used to using one vendor for your needs, it's not necessarily proper to just switch it up and use someone else willy-nilly. Anyhow, Lot is traveling with Abraham, and he too, because of Abraham, he is also laden with flocks, with cattle, with tents. And now there's a little bit of a scuffle here between Lot and his shepherds and Abraham and his shepherds. There's there's too much possessions, and it's getting kind of crowding, claustrophobic, and there's also disagreements in policy. Rashi tells us that Lot, in his view, he's the sole heir to all of Abraham's fortune. After all, Abraham doesn't have any children, and he's the closest relative. He's a brother-in-law, he's a nephew, and who's going to inherit Abraham? Lot. Well, God promised Abraham that he's going to give him the land of Israel. Ergo, who's the heir to the land of Israel? In Lot's eyes, it's Lot. And therefore, Lot travels around the land and he instructs his shepherds, don't muzzle the animals, the mouths of the animals that you're sending around the land because after all, all the land really belongs to us. Everyone is here is really squatting on our land. And whereas Abraham's Instru- Abraham instructs his shepherds, no, you have to muzzle your animals, don't have adventure in someone, else's, in someone else's field to eat up its produce because it doesn't belong to us yet. But regardless, there's an escalation here in the tension between Abraham and Lot. And Abraham says to him, listen, you know, I want to be friends with you. I want to, we're brothers, we're kinsmen, but it's not working out. So you tell me, do you want to go this way? Do you want to head right? I'll head left. You want to head left, I'll have I'll head right. Whichever direction you go, I'm going to go in the opposite direction. We'll still be close. We'll still be friends. We'll still visit every once in a while. Sure, but let's give us some breathing room so that you and me won't have to deal with this tension. And Lot makes the bad decision to head towards the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. He looks at the plains of Jordan, and it was like the garden of Hashem. It was bountiful. It was luscious. It was so robust with material wealth that he said, I'm going to choose this direction. He heads towards the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the Torah tells us that these people are wicked. They're sinful before God. But Lot says, Lot is tantalized by the financial opportunities. He heads towards the or Abraham heads in the opposite direction direction. Once Lot has parted from Abraham, immediately God returns to Abraham, gives him another prophecy, tells him to look look up, raise his eyes, see everywhere that he could see, north, south, east, west, the whole land of Israel, the whole land that's now called the land of Canaan, to you I will give it and to your descendants forever. I will make your offspring as numerous as the dust of the earth, just like it's impossible to count the particles of dust on the land, so too it'll be impossible to count your offspring. And now God tells him, walk the land through its length, through its breadth, for to you I will give it. So Abraham moves his tent and came and dwelled in the plains of Mamre, which are in Hebron, which is again south of Jerusalem. And again, he builds an altar for God. So this is the second time in our Parsha where Abraham is is given the pledge that his descendants will have the land of Israel. But here we're told in addition that his nation that will emerge from him will be as numerous as the dust of the earth, just like it's impossible to count the amount of particles of dust in the land, just like that number is beyond the scope of what we could possibly even imagine in our head. It's so large. So too, 
the Jewish people, they're going to have a spiritual quantity that will supersede the scope of numbers. They won't be able to be put into any limitations. They're going to be so explosive in their impact that it's not going to be able to be properly quantified. Now, it's interesting. God tells them to look across the land in all directions, and then he tells them to walk across the land in all directions. And the commentaries point out that Abraham's acquisition and conquest of the land was really twofold. There was a spiritual acquisition of the land, and then there was a physical conquest of the land. And therefore, for the spiritual conquest, he told him to look, look at it. And that was kind of the spiritual means of acquisition. And the physical means of acquisition was conquered. He conquered it, so to speak, for his descendants by traversing the entire land. Now, chapter 14 tells of a, of a world war, essentially, that happened in the region. There was four kings, and they battled five kings, and the Torah describes the names of the kings, and the, the locations, and the result of the war. But the reason why it's significant to our narrative is because these four kings that defeated the five kings, they ransacked the city of Sodom and Gomorrah and they kidnapped, they captured Lot and all his possessions. And therefore, Abraham felt compelled to join in this conflict because he wanted to rescue his nephew and his brother-in-law. So they tell him that uh, his Brother Lot has been captured. Abraham hears it right away. He arms his household and he gets involved in the war. And he, with his servants, deployed against them at night and struck them. He mounts a counterattack against the victorious four kings. He pursues them as far as, as Chova, which is to the north of Damascus. And he is successful. He brings back all the possessions and he's able to recover all the hostages and all their possessions and all the women and all the children. So now the erstwhile defeated group of five kings, they've been saved by Abraham. And Abraham, even though he is told, listen, you you won the war for us. You could have your first dibs and all the spoils. He's not interested in taking any of the spoils. What he does is he goes over to Malki Tzedek, who Rashi tells us is uh, Shem, the son of Noah. He's the king of Salem, which is, again, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And he decides, because this person is such a venerated priest of God, he gives him 10% of all his money. And then they start negotiating about the booty about the loot of the victorious war. And the king of Sodom, one of the five kings that was saved by Abraham, says to Abraham, listen, I'll take all the hostages, I'll take all my constituents, and you take all the money, you take all the gold, all the possessions for yourself. And Abraham says to the king of Sodom, I lift up my hands to God in heaven, creator of heaven and earth. I'm not going to take a single thread or a shoe strap from you you're not going to be able to say, you know what, I made Abraham rich. All I'm going to take is I want you to pay the people, my disciples that helped me in the war, let them take their share, but I'm not taking a single thing. Why did Abraham not want to take the spoils and the riches that he deserved? So Rashi tells us, does God promise to make Abraham rich? Abraham is going to be blessed by God. He does not want to get a free handle from some human. He wants to get it directly from God. Now, it's interesting. The Torah points out that even though Abraham himself didn't want to, he was, he, he refrained from taking any of the spoils, that did not extend to the people that were with them. He himself says, I'm going to withdraw from taking any of the benefits, but the people who are with me, it's not their fault that I want to withhold from this. They get their share. Moreover, Rashi points out that even though there was different groups amongst his Amongst his cadre, there were some people that engaged in the actual warfare. And some people, like there is by every war, they were in charge of guarding the supply lines. Still, Abraham said they all got recompensed with the same proportion. Even though the soldiers who risked their lives 
at the front lines, they maybe should arguably get a, a larger share of the spoils. No, Abraham says that the people who guard the supplies get the same share. And by the way, in the book of Samuel, we read that David did the same thing. And the obvious question is, you know, I don't, I don't get it. If, if I'm the one who's actually facing death on the front lines, isn't it reasonable that I should get a larger share of the booty? It's a good question. And I think the, I think the answer is, is that that's true indeed in a conventional war. But Abraham is saying, listen, this is a miraculous war. It's God who's doing the battle. It's just me and my group, and we're taking on these four victorious teams, and we won, but we're really, it's not us who's victorious. It's God. We're going through the motions, but ultimately, it's God who is waging the war. And therefore, whoever is helping God, so to speak, whoever is, whoever is participating in this effort, they should be rewarded. And there really is no difference between someone at the front lines and someone guarding the supplies. Now, the Ramban points out that when Abraham rejects the spoils from the king of Sodom, he swears. He says, I lift up my hands to heaven. I'm promising. I'm swearing. I'm taking an oath. I'm not going to take a single thing. Why did he have to swear? That's a good, that's a question that the Ramban dwells upon. And he says something I think very powerful, very relevant. He says, Righteous people, whenever they're in a challenge, whenever they're faced with a dilemma, whenever their yetzer or the evil inclination may have an opportunity and inroads to get them to make a mistake, they right away try to lock it into a corner by making an oath. We maybe think that we're strong enough, we're resolute enough in our spiritual standing to withstand temptation. And here we see that Abraham says, no. I'm not going to rely on my finesse to overcome this challenge. I'm going to kind of concretize my decision of not partaking in the booty, even though I may be inclined to do so by making an oath. And this is an interesting tactic that maybe we could use in our own challenges with our own yetzer, with our own evil inclination, that to try to kind of give force to our yetzer tov, to our good inclination by almost forcing the issue, not necessarily making an oath, but amplifying the forces ensuring to make the right decision. Chapter 15 picks up right after the war. And again, God appears to Abram in a vision, telling him, don't be scared. I am your shield. Your reward is very great. So Rashi tells us something very interesting, a pattern that we see throughout the Torah. Abraham, after he was victorious against a massive army of four teams, he's worried. Maybe this miracle exhausted my spiritual merits. Maybe I had some merits, but now I lost them because of the miracle that happened. And God tells him, don't worry. I am your shield. Your reward is very great. Don't worry that you have lost your spiritual bank account You've exhausted, you've depleted it in this war. And this is a theme that we see, uh, for example, see it again in Genesis when Jacob is about to be reunited with his brother and he's worried that his brother may have some nefarious plans. He makes the same kind of argument where he tells God, I'm, I, maybe I have nothing left. Maybe all the goodness that you have done to me, maybe that's depleted my spiritual bank account, my spiritual reserves of merits. It's an interesting perspective because, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, these are the giants, the founders of Jewish history, the pillars of the world, and they're worried that maybe they've exhausted all their spiritual merits. And I think for us, we're like, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty good guy. I'm righteous. I put on tefillin today. I prayed today. I'm one of the good guys. I got plenty of leeway. That's maybe a perspective that we're likely to have. And here we see that Abraham, the great Abraham, the great innovator that brought monotheism into the world, he's a prophet. God's talking to him. You would think for sure he's got plenty of leeway, plenty of grace period, and he himself is worried, and God has to reassure him. And Abraham says, Let, listen, it's great that you reassure me, but who's going to inherit me? I don't have any children. And all I have is my right-hand man, Eliezer, and he's going to be the one that inherits me. So God tells him, again, no, this person, Eliezer, will not inherit you. Only he 
who shall come forth from within you, your actual biological child, will inherit you. And he takes him outside, look at the heavens, look at the stars. If you can count the stars, that's how you should be able to count your offspring. Just like it's impossible to count the stars, there's so many of them, so too the Jewish people, similar to the idea we had earlier, just like the dust and the stars are, are things which are so beyond, we can't fathom numbers so large, so to the Jewish people are going to have a spiritual entity, a spiritual quality that's going to render them beyond the ability to be quantified in conventional ways. Now, it is interesting that even though the amount of stars that exist and the amount of dust particles that exist are so, so large, there's still a grand difference between a dust particle and a whole star. You know, the, our sun that gives us light and maintains this – the only reason why we could live is because we have a sun that keeps this world warm and gives us light. That's like an average star. And there are stars that are much, much, much larger. So obviously a, a, one star is something so massive and one dust particle is something so insignificant and we're compared to both. And this is almost like the, the, the Jewish dilemma. We have the ability to transcend everything, to be so incredibly, to be, to be such a beacon of light. But unfortunately, we also have the ability to descend to the lowest depths and be something so insignificant. And that's what it means to be a Jew. It means to chew, yes, your impact and your role and your spot in the nation. Like you ha- you'll be part of something very big and something very incalculable. But it's your choice. To, is it to be stars or is it to be dust particles? And again, for the third time, God tells him, I am Hashem who brought you out of Ur Kastim to give you this land to inherit. A third time in our Parsha, God tells Abraham, your descendants will inherit this land. And Abraham asked, well, how do I know that I'll inherit it? And God says, okay, we're going to make a we're going to make a covenant, take some animals, cut them in half, walk between them. And there's a lot of symbolism here. Rashi points out that Abraham cuts up the animals but doesn't cut up the birds. The birds represent the Jewish people. They're going to survive. These other massive animals, They, uh, even though they may see so, so, seem so imposing in their heyday, but ultimately they're going – those other empires which are represented by those animals are going to be destroyed. And then God tells him something else. Behold, a dread, great darkness fell upon him. And he said to Abraham, know with certainty that your offspring shall be aliens in a land not their own, and they will serve them and they will oppress them for 400 years. But also they shall, they will serve, I shall judge, and afterwards they will leave with great wealth. So here God tells him, you know what? You asked me for a proof you asked me for some sort of covenant that your children will inherit the land of Israel. I'll give that to you, but part and parcel of that pledge is the fact that they will have to be foreigners in a foreign land, that they're going to be oppressed, they're going to be mistreated for 400 years, but then they'll leave, they'll leave with great wealth and the nation that they will leave from, that they will be oppressed in, they will be punished. And after four generations of being in this foreign land, they're going to come back to the land of Israel and then they're going to settle it permanently. And of course, this is a reference to what's called the Egyptian exile. The Jewish people are going to be in Egypt for hundreds of years, not quite 400. Rashi tells us that the clock starts ticking once Isaac is born. So exactly 400 years from the birth of Isaac is when the etch that has happened, but the actual enslavement or the actual exile, the amount of time that the Jewish people were in the land of Egypt was only 210 years, but that's still able to fulfill this provision of a 400-year exile because that all was set into motion with the birth of Isaac. But it's interesting that if you if you kind of read the juxtaposition of these pledges, on one hand, we're told the nations would be so great, like the stars, we're going to have the land of Israel for the third time we're promised, but you should surely know that this is all conditional. There's a certain prerequisite that we have to be in the land of, of Egypt for 400 years. Why is being enslaved, why is that a necessary precondition 
to being the nation that inherits the land of Israel? That's a great question. And in fact, I think I did an entire podcast episode uh, several years back on this question. But just quickly, I think that the, the idea is that for the Jewish people to be God's chosen nation, for the Jewish people to be the, the, the nation that's worthy of having the of having the temple, of having God's presence amongst them, they have to be at a much higher standard than just any other nation. And in the beginning of, of Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 20, we read that the experience in Egypt is being compared to an iron crucible, which is a device that is used to purify gold. And the implication is the Jewish people were gold before they went into Egypt, but they weren't pure gold. Once they left Egypt, the gold was refined and now it's pure. And now the nation is worthy of being in the land of Israel and having God amongst them. So the big picture is that ultimately this multi-century experience in a foreign land is something that they actually gain something positive out of it. And the Torah reiterates, on that day, Hashem made a covenant with Abraham, saying to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates River, the Canaanite, the Kenizzite, the Kadmonite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, all the nations that are there. He lists them. That land of those nations belonged to us. Chapter 16 talks about Abraham's wife, Sarai, and her maidservant, Hagar. Now, Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. She had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. Now, how did Sarai end up with an Egyptian maidservant? Says Rashi, this woman, Hagar, she was the daughter of Pharaoh. And when Pharaoh saw all the miracles happening to Sarai, he said, you know what? My daughter, it's better for her to be a maidservant to Abraham and Sarai than to be a princess here, and he sent her to join Abraham's household. And like we said about for Pharaoh earlier, we think of him as some ancient barbarian, but we see that he had a certain spiritual sensitivity, and here we see that he sent his own daughter to be a maidservant in Pharaoh's home. It's better for her there than to be a princess in Egypt. It's very unlikely that the president of the United States would send his daughter to go study or to go in the home of a great, the greatest rabbi. You know, he's so impressed with this person's character that it's better for his daughter. No, no one would do that. But here we see that Pharaoh did do that. Again, there's something special uh, about him. Now, what's the significance of this woman, Hagar? So Sarai tells Abraham, now see that Hashem has restrained from me, restrained me from bearing I can't have any children. Why don't you marry my maidservant? Perhaps I will be built up through her. So Sarai tells Abraham, why don't you marry my maidservant, Hagar, and I will be built through this experience. So simply, simply stated, what this means is, is that Hagar will have a child and that will be like an adopted child for Sarai. That's what you would think simply. Rashi says something totally different. Rashi says, in the merit that I will allow this woman, this maidservant of mine, to enter my own household in the spiritual merit of that, I too will have a child. There's a, a deep point that Rashi is saying, that Sarai is acknowledging that the reason why she doesn't have any children is not because of some sort of biological problem, but it's because God determined that she shouldn't have any children. And therefore, just like God determined she shouldn't have, she shouldn't have any children, God could change the position, and determine that she should have children. But she has to earn it, Sarai realizes this. And how do you earn it? How do you lobby God to change your nature and allow you to have children? You have to earn it via spiritual means. And she says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to swallow the most bitter pill possible. I'm going to allow a competitor for my husband. I'm going to allow him to marry this other woman. Moreover, a woman that she's my maidservant? And by me absorbing that spiritual pain, that's going to give me the strength to tell God, you know what, I did that, now will you reconsider? So indeed that happens. 
Abraham marries Hagar, and she becomes pregnant. And she starts to not honor Sarai the same way she did previously. And Sarai gets disappointed. I gave this woman to my husband, and now she's ridiculing me. And Abraham tells Sarai, listen, whatever you decide to do, we'll do. Do with your maidservant as you see fit. Sarai deals harshly with her, and Hagar flees. And she's met by an angel. And the angel says to her, listen, go back to Sarai. It's okay for you to submit yourself to her treatment of you. Ultimately, it's good for you. You're going to have a son who is going to be the father of a great nation. His, his name is going to be Ishmael. He's going to be a wild man. His hand is going to be everywhere. Everyone's hand is going to be against him. But ultimately, he's going to spawn a great nation. She heads back to Abraham and Sarai. She lives there. Eventually, she has a son. The son, his name is Ishmael. Abraham at the time is 86 years old, and Ishmael is born. Chapter 17 begins 13 years later. Abraham has a 13-year-old son. His name is Ishmael. Abraham is now 99. His wife, Sarai, is 89. And God appears to Abraham and tells him, I'm God, walk before me and be perfect. And this is the run-up to the mitzvah in our parsha, the mitzvah of circumcision. God tells him, walk before me and be perfect. Says Rashi, right now, God tells Abraham, you're not perfect. Why? Because so long as you have the foreskin upon you, you are blemished. However, once you fix that, once you undo that, once you rectify that, once you perfect your body, then you will be perfect. And that's also interesting here that this mitzvah, the run-up to this mitzvah is where God tells Abraham to walk before me. That's words that appear elsewhere in the Torah. Uh, you should walk in the ways of God. And this implies that whatever the mitzvah of circumcision represents, it's not just a one-time deal. It's not just like a one minor procedure that you do to a small baby or in the case of Abraham, a 90-year-old, 99-year-old man. It's not a one-off mitzvah. There's something there that represents a certain relationship that it is symbolic of a relationship between man and God that is really something that a person can live with their entire lives. So Abraham throws himself on his face. God speaks to him. This is my covenant with you. You should be a father of a multitude of nations. Your name is no longer Abraham. It should be Abraham. You're going to be a father of many nations. I will make you most exceedingly fruitful, and many nations and kings shall descend from you. I will ratify my covenant between me and you and between your offspring after you throughout the generations, an everlasting covenant to be a God for you and to your offspring after you. I will give you the land of your sojourns, the whole land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession. Again, this is the fourth time that it's been promised to Abraham. And what is this whole contingent upon? As for you, you shall keep my covenant you and your offspring after you throughout the generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep to me and you and your offspring after you. Every male amongst you shall be circumcised. So it's interesting. Abraham's told not only will he have a great nation, he's the father of many nations. What are these many nations? So Rashi says that there's three great monotheistic religions. There is going to be, of course, Ishmael is already born. He's going to be the, the progenitor of the Muslims and the Arabs. And, of course, there's the nation of Israel, the Jewish people that have not yet been born. Isaac has not yet been born. Jacob, of course, Abraham's son, who's going to be the father of the 12 tribes, is not yet born. Esau, who is going to be the spiritual progenitor of the Christians, he's also not not being born. But all these are directly descendants from Abraham. Abraham's two sons are going to be Isaac and Ishmael, the fathers of the Jews and the Muslims. And Abraham's grandson is going to be Esau who in Jewish philosophy and Jewish literature is the father of the Christians. And that's the many nations that's being referred to. The Ramban has a little bit of a different take on this. The Ramban says when it says that Abraham's going to be the father of many nations, that's not referring to many different nations, but rather many nations amongst the Jewish people. There's many different strands. We're not a monolithic people. It's, a, it's like with prayer. 
you know, the Sephardic prayer is different than the Ashkenazic prayer, and then there's the Hasidic prayer, and then there's various places in North Africa and Middle East. Each one has their own little style, and that's okay. And in fact, the Arizal used to teach that in heaven, there's 12 gates through which prayer is able to enter. And each one of the tribes of Israel has their own special way of connecting with God via prayer. Of course, you could have made one massive gate for everyone, but no, we're like a nation with with lots of diversity. Each tribe has its own style, and that's okay. That doesn't detract from the nation. In fact, it enhances it. And it's interesting here in this whole promise that God gives to Abraham. He's 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 connecting the circumcision with the land of Israel, with the Jewish people believing in God. And Rashi says something very astonishing in verse 8. I'm going to be the God of you and your offspring, and I'm going to give you the land of Israel. Says Rashi, if someone lives in Israel, then they have a connection with God. But if someone lives outside of Israel, then they don't believe in God, which is a very astonishing statement. But uh, my grandfather used to answer this by saying that every land, every country, every nation has a spiritual angel through which the godly influence is filtered, whereas the land of Israel has no buffer separating God from the land of Israel. So there's almost like an unrestrained relationship between the inhabitants of the land of Israel and God. And that is, I think, what is you know this, so significant about this land. Four times Abraham is promised to have him and his descendants land of Israel, what's so significant? Why can't we have moved to a different place in the world? You know, it's like Golda Mary used to complain that Moses brought the Jewish people to the one place in the Middle East that doesn't have any oil. I think I guess that was before they discovered the massive gas fields or whatever. Maybe there still is oil. Who knows? But what's so special about this land? And here we see the answer. This is the place where people, where humans can connect to God in the most unadulterated fashion. So much so that Rashi says that if you live outside of Israel and you're locked out of this amazing relationship, it's almost as if you don't believe in God. Now, just quite briefly, the idea of the circumcision, I think, does get at a lot of the major themes of Abraham's own personal life and really of the Jewish nation going forward. The sources tell us that during the circumcision, we we are removing the cover and exposing and revealing the crown of God. Just like we're perfecting our body in the circumcision, that is symbolic and emblematic of the national mission of the Jewish people to reveal the crown of God in the world. And therefore, Abraham, who was the greatest innovator in this whole field. And he was the one who discovered this idea on his own, the idea of God, and disseminated it to the world. He was the one who began the process of undoing the darkness and the chaos that existed prior and revealing the crown of the world. He is given the mitzvah of circumcision, which symbolizes this transformation that our nation is tasked with bringing about in the world. You shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, that it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. This is one of the three mitzvahs in the Torah that's called a sign and os between the Jewish people and God, the other two being the mitzvah of Shabbos and the mitzvah of Tefillin, of the phylacteries that we wear on our arm, next to our heart, and on our head. Every male who is born in the household shall be circumcised. If you don't circumcise, you're cutting yourself out from the Jewish people. You're invalidating my covenant. This is the brand of the Jew. In Talmudic literature, one of the names of a Jew is a circumcised one, and the name of a non-Jew will be an uncircumcised one. There's something that represents the entirety of the Jewish nation that is symbolized in this mitzvah. This is what it means to be part of the Abrahamic fraternity. In fact, at a circumcision ceremony today, there's two blessings. The blessing, number one, is the blessing on the mitzvah of the circumcision. And the second blessing is, Lahachniso beviso shal ramavinu, to enter the child into the covenant of Abraham, our forefather. Whatever relationship Abraham had with God, we're incorporating a small child at the age of eight days into that very same and select and special relationship. And again, God tells Abraham, ask for your wife Sarai, 
Don't call her Sarai. Her name is now Sarah. Sarah. I will bless her indeed. I will give you a son through her. I will bless her and she shall give rise to nations. Teens of people will rise from her. Previously, Abraham was told that he'll have children, which could have been fulfilled with children from a different wife, maybe even Ishmael. Now, God tells Abraham, no, Sarai, your wife Sarah, she will have children too. And of course, Abraham realizes, you know, she's 89 years old. The biological clock has been ticking for a long time for her. And now God says that she's going to have a child. And Abraham's so delighted, he gives a squeal of delight. He starts laughing. Unbelievable. I'm 100 years old. Sarai's 90 years old. She's going to have a child. Unbelievable. How exciting, how incredible. God, Abraham tells God, I don't even deserve it. If only Ishmael will live before you. I have one son. Maybe that's that's enough. How could I even anticipate having another son? God says, no. Your wife Sarah will bear you a child. Name him Isaac, Yitzchak. And all the promises that I have given you with the land of Israel and all the other things that I've promised are going to be fulfilled through her. Ishmael will be okay. He's going to be blessed. He's going to be fruitful. He's going to be increased most exceedingly. He's going to beget all kinds of princes. He'll father a great nation. But your legacy is going to be fulfilled through Isaac, the son born through Sarah at this time next year. And when the prophecy was over, verse 22 tells us God ascended from above Abraham. And this is interesting. Rashi tells us that this implies that Abraham is part of the chariot of God, meaning that when Abraham's prophecy ended, it wasn't that Abraham departed from God, rather God departed from Abraham, meaning that had God wanted to talk to Abraham more, Abraham would have been ready. Just like you have a a king's chariot is always ready for the king at a a moment's notice, so to Abraham and indeed Isaac and Jacob, they are always ready for prophecy. And the Parsha ends, Abraham takes his son Ishmael and his whole household, every male, and they circumcise their flesh on that very day. Abraham was 99 when he was circumcised. His son Ishmael was 13. And next week, we're going to pick up what happens to Abraham a few short days after his circumcision ceremony has been completed.